Oh, good morning again. I want to thank Carolyn for her wonderful story this morning. It, uh, it uh, touched on all the themes that I'm going to be touching on in this sermon. And it started with a story. When I was in elementary school, our grade six class was tagged to sing Silent Night in the school Christmas pageant. And we practiced in the classroom for weeks ahead. And um, oops. We practiced in the classroom for weeks ahead. And as we came down to performance day, Mrs. Grady took me aside, looked at me in the eye and said a little bit fiercely, don't sing, mouth the words. Now, as you might expect, it was a little bit crushing to me. I love that song, but I didn't sing then and not much for many, many years afterwards, unless I was very much alone. At home, the only music that ever played was on the record player or the radio. No one played, no one sang. And back then in the early 60s, Catholic churches were not into hymns. So singing just wasn't a part of my life, aside from singing very quietly to myself when a song I knew came on the radio. Now, to be fair to Mrs. Grady, I realized many years later that our version of Silent Night was in an awfully high key tuned to suit the sweet little girl sopranos and i was hitting a pubescent voice change i couldn't reach sleep in heavenly peace with a ladder and a sky hook not then but still being told not to sing with no explanation well that hurt but back then teachers didn't very often give explanations. They gave orders. Now, for the last two years, I have been singing tenor in the Edmonton Metropolitan Chorus. It's a long-established non-audition community choir of about 50 voices. And my wife has been a member for years and is often the soprano soloist and an occasional voice coach. She is that good. Choir practice is something we get to do together as a couple. Now, no one is ever going to offer me a solo wisely, but I have become a competent chorister. You see, after that elementary school shut down a long time ago, when I was in my 20s, a friend at church said, of course you can sing. All it takes is practice and someone to sing with. And he invited me to join their living room magical group of about eight of us that they had just because they liked making music. They didn't worry about being good. They didn't worry about me being good. They just wanted to have fun singing. I never thought such a thing was possible. As a minister, I write for a living, and yet I've never dared call myself a writer. Writers write long novels or plays that get published or produced. But I write these 15-minute scripts about what's on my mind this week. I was a newspaper reporter a long time ago, a job I got almost dishonestly because I was really more a photographer in the college paper. But I applied for a reporter position, and they were desperate, so I got it. But that work was just stringing together facts and quotes. It wasn't really writing, was it? I worked in theater for a time as a young man, amateur and professional, sets, stage management, lighting, and so on. I helped present plays, but I never considered myself a theatrical artist. I had a long affair with photography in college at the newspaper and even working in a portrait studio, but I only thought of myself as a, a technician with a camera, either with the knack for capturing action sometimes or snapping someone's good side. It was work. It wasn't art. Now, I'm not moaning or complaining here, but I will suggest that no one ever encouraged me to think that I could do art in any form. That might be true for a lot of us. Artist, musician, writer were self-descriptors that were never going to apply to me. But here's the critical question the one offered by the sister in our children's story. Why not? Why not? 
what do those labels mean? Why was I not an artist? Well, I suppose you could list things like lack of talent, lack of training, lack of vision, lack of ability. Those would certainly be inhibitors. You see, people in the arts produce things that other people actually want to see and read. And because I'd never been taught or encouraged, I figured that couldn't possibly be me. Whether or not I had the potential, I did not have the courage. So I hovered around the fringes, helping mount shows, taking pictures, and so on, kind of basking in a reflected glow of the stars. Now, I'm not telling the story to moan, but to suggest that I don't think my story is unique. We live in a world where a lot of people say, you can't do that, or don't try, or in this scathing social media world, we are trolled and torn down if we ever do poke our heads up and try something new. It's kind of sad. That kind of feedback perpetuates a nasty societal norm. Artists are people like Van Gogh or, or even Banksy. Musicians are people like Yo-Yo Ma or maybe Taylor Swift. And writers are people like Margaret Atwood or James Patterson. Okay, I like crime stories a lot. But do you get where I'm going here? That the only people who deserve those titles were people who had really succeeded at it and who had made a lot of money. <laughs> what an incredible burden we place on ourselves if we accept that absurd definition. But I guess many of you know that. Me? Uh, I was a bit of a slow learner. Some of us get squashed before we even start. Or perhaps we invite people to squash us. I, and I think much of society, gets hung up on describing the artistic endeavor in terms of some stratospheric quality of success. And frankly, success is so entirely subjective that it has nothing to do with art art of any kind is about finding joy in the expression. It's about letting your, your hands or your voice or your body pour something out for you, not for anybody else. And then maybe we stand back and look at it and say, hey, that wasn't bad. And we share it with someone else. But first off, art is doing and creating and making. Sing as if no one is listening, dance as if no one is watching is the meme. But that's also a really good definition of art. Whatever happens afterwards, that's not art. It may be something else that's valuable, but applause or sales or a paycheck, that's not art. The problem we have often is equating art with whatever comes afterwards. And that robs art of its raison d'etre. Art isn't about money, though being paid is really nice. Art is about expressing something, about feeling good about your creativity. And in the case of choral singing, getting that little rush that comes from just exercising your lungs each week. You see, and this is key, it's about your expression not about someone else's reaction. Art is first and foremost about you and your heart. It's not about anybody else. Reaction to whatever kind of art we do doesn't belong to us. That's, that's, that's about the people reacting. We have a right to make our effort. They have a right to like it or not. So what? I love libraries. You know why? It's not just because they're free, but it's because that lack of cost frees me. I can start reading someone's work, some project that they have poured themselves into and decide not to finish it. That's not disrespect. And it's not because it's a bad book. That would be a presumptuous judgment on my part. No. 
I set it aside because it just doesn't appeal to me. It doesn't grab me at this time and place in my life. And that's only about me and about that time and that place. It's not about the author and it's not about the book. But because it's from a library, I can just say, not finishing this and give it back for somebody else to hopefully find and enjoy. Art is of any kind is just an effort to communicate something inside of us and maybe connect with another person one at a time. And if we figure this out, then a lot of the pomp and the pressure go out of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've had the good fortune to visit many art museums in my life in Europe and North America. I've been up close and personal with some of the great masters and mistresses. And it took me a long time to realize that some of those great works, I just didn't care for them very much. It wasn't that they weren't incredible pieces. And it wasn't that I was some kind of bumpkinish dullard. It was that that particular piece or the subject or whatever didn't speak to me. It didn't connect with me. There's nothing wrong with that. I developed a little game that I would play with myself and later with my children and whomever I was with in a gallery. You walk into one of the gallery rooms, you know how they're often broken off into smaller sections and you stand in the middle of the room and then you slowly turn a circle and briefly take in each work. Then pause for a moment and ask yourself, which one catches your eye? If it's one, if it's two, those are the ones you go up and stand in front of and look at and try and figure out why it caught your eye. And then if you're with someone, explain it to them. And then ask them which one caught their eye. I've learned so much from my children by them appreciating paintings or sculptures that did nothing for me. But just listening to their, well, back then, eight or 10-year-old voices saying that they liked the color or the angle or the shape. That's, every opinion is valid. And my kids love that game. We still play it. And they're adults now. And the point, appreciate the pieces that speak to you. You don't need to disparage the rest. They will no doubt speak to others. I mean, they are in a museum for some reason. But spend the time appreciating the work of an artist that moved you. Now, when you look at it this way, it has nothing to do objectively with the quality or the price tag or the fashion or the fame of the artist who created it. It has even less to do with the fact that it's in a museum. It has everything to do with you and what strikes you as beautiful and moving and meaningful on any given day. It's a cheesy cliche, but beauty really is in the eye of the beholder. And after all, in some sense, once an art piece is put out in public, it does become a dialogue, a conversation. Whatever you make will speak to someone, even if it's only you. And that's okay, because you are the original and most important audience member anyway. And why do artists do art and composers compose and musicians interpret music and writers write? And mostly they write to express something they feel or capture something they experienced or something they've heard in their head. That someone else comes along and appreciates it, that's a bonus. That someone comes along and gives you money to do it, <laughs> that's a lottery win. And while some people will go out and commercialize their work just to get money and fame, well, okay, that happens. But somewhere underneath all of that is someone who started to do it just for love. Now, that's a bit of a contrast to traditional understandings of art. Most of the critic statements speak to the idea of communication as the definition and purpose of the arts, as if the artist sets out to send some kind of specific message. But I really think we have to step back from that. I've come to believe that the real power of art is not the product or the message it conveys, 
what's important to me is the transformation of the artist and the satisfaction gained from the effort of making art. The real joy should be in expressing our creativity and yes, in developing our technical ability if we choose to pursue it. So let's bring it back to you and me. Earlier, I listed all the things I wasn't good at. I left the worst for last. Drawing. Folks, my fine motor skills are just gross. I was once sued for defamation by a stick figure I tried to draw. But as I was leaving for a trip to France many years ago, a friend handed me a sketchbook and a pencil set. I don't draw. I don't care. Promise me that once a day you will sit down and draw something you see. Just look at it and try and capture something about it. You don't even have to show me when you get back. I love a good challenge. So I did. Uh, few people have ever seen those sketches. They are technically very, very poor. But each time I look at that book, I vividly remember the act of drawing them. Where I was, what the weather was like, and most importantly, what captured my imagination about that particular scene. That's what makes it art. However you define your art, whatever you do, do it for the pleasure of creation. Enjoy the failures as much as the successes. Turn off the inner editor. <laughs> as Carolyn said, anything you do is worth doing poorly, or Carolyn's dad, I guess. So turn off your inner editor. Don't worry about it. Make something, draw something, and enjoy the act of creation. Thank you.